Hello, my name is Marcus. I'm the compiler of a collection of therapy quotes entitled 1001 Windmills of the Mind, a collection of quotes taken from what's often called the psychodynamic or the psychoanalytic perspective, which, as I understand it, was called philosophical medicine long ago. This perspective seeks to link, uh, to bring into awareness how something in the past is being relived in the present. If we can do so, then we can lay the ghost to rest and the ghost becomes an ancestor. So troublesome feelings from the past uh, can be um, witnessed, accepted, and then they're a part of our narrative, they're a we accept them, um, so we heal the inner child. Um, the theory is, uh, if there's any kind of uh, pain in childhood, um, the baby creates a memory of it, called a traumatic script, and then, or a blueprint, or or a schema, or an internal working model. It's in his memories. And it's causing uh, the, the child uh, emotional, psychic pain. Uh, the, so the psyche seeks healing. So maybe uh, the psyche thinks if the child or the person can relive the scene that caused that pain to see if they can master it or get a better outcome so it's not so painful, that's the positive intention of repetition compulsion. Right. Um, but if we can be our our own caring witness, uh, then um, then we're giving ourselves uh, the love that we needed. If we can give ourselves the love that we needed, then that script, uh, the inner child in pain, uh, feels better. And, it's, and the script is changed. So we don't change the past, but we change the effect of the past. So we're, change, we're transmuting or transfiguring um, the effect of our memories if we can uh, be our own caring witness such that the inner child uh, feels understood and the memories, uh, the ghosts uh, become ancestors. Um, Charles Burke puts it this way, he says, the psychoanalytic perspective is about unpicking the threads of a traumatic script and using those threads to weave a new, healthier script. Yeah. So, to recognize the script, which is being repeated in the present, over and over again, like Sisyphus, thinking the person can get a better outcome. It can't be done. That's the positive intention to see if the person can get a better outcome, but it can't. No person in the present can be the breast mother, and no one can travel back in a time machine to get it right. But this repetition compulsion is kind of, if we can observe it and see it, it's kind of like a mirror. So rep, we have a quote repetition compulsion is the means. Of bringing the traumatic script to consciousness. That's based on another quote which says, projection, right? projecting the past in the present, transferring the past, childhood past into the present. This is the means, this is the way, this is the means of bringing the unknown, forgotten material to present consciousness. So the psychoanalytic perspective is about this kind of a uh, um, recognition um, because um, developmental trauma like that leads to complicated grief aggravated grief right. grief is healed when it's witnessed by a caring other so to a certain degree we can be our own caring witness right. um, and how how do we be our own caring witness Okay. So we have one poet says, psychoanalysis, always looking for an egg in a basket that's missing. So the missing, the missing basket means we need to weave 
consciousness. Yeah. Uh, so, for example, the attempt here in 1001 Windmills of the Mind, which now has over 2,000 quotes to the collection, there are roughly 30 threads or themes or topics or threads, and they, and they all can be interwoven, they're all interlinked. So, building uh, so these uh, theories, they're all approximations, they're all working hypotheses, there's no perfect answer. These uh, quotes uh, attempt, attempt to uh, build this basket. Uh, and that means we're giving us, we're giving ourselves caring witness. Okay, so we're giving ourselves the uh, basic trust. When we have the basic trust, then the feelings come up. The egg appears in the basket. So first we weave the basket, then the egg appears. In the egg, we have the firebird. That's the morning. Uh, our feelings come out. The key can be in there. We get the golden ball. We get our vitality back. We find our I, our ontological self, our true self, our real self. All of the treasure is in the egg. But first we need um, to weave the basket. Then the egg appears. Yeah. So the psychoanalytic perspective is about this weaving of the, of the basket. And so we're trying to be objective and observe ourselves and so on. Um, Hold on a sec. How are we doing today? I think it's just started to rain here. Yeah. Okay, got a little rain today. That's okay. <laughs> Listen to the falling rain. Okay. <laughs> When I do these videos outdoors, I turn the camera around every time I see a possible bird or something. So, <laughs> um, I, I've given um, an overview of this project in many of my recent videos, so maybe I'll maybe I'll uh, just keep it short this time. Um, so the psychoanalytic perspective, um, we look at defense mechanisms. These are operations of the mind or maneuvers of the mind that the baby adopts uh, to deal with uh, the misattunement with the mother. So we have a threat on why a mother might be misattuned. We have another threat uh, about how the misattunement with the mother means that how the child feels shamed by it. So shame is a threat. And then if the child feels shamed, he may grow up and want to shame others to communicate that he felt shamed as a child. That's called negative magic gesture. That's a threat. Um, we have a threat on splitting. If the child is being misattuned by the mother and he's scared, how does he feed with the mother? Well, he hallucinates that the mother's all good, rejecting the reality that she's being refusing and difficult and complicated. He can't handle that. That's called splitting. So he creates two concepts of the mother, good breast, bad breast, but he denies that he's relating to the bad breast mother, and he hallucinates that he's bonding to the good breast mother. But that's temporary. By the age of three, the child realizes that the mother is an ordinary person, partly loving, partly frustrating, and he can accept that. Um, that's a huge achievement, that's a huge accomplishment. But the, but the child only gets that. Um, the child is only able to bring the two sides together if the mother is more fr loving than frustrating. If, if the mother is more frustrating, if she's chronically misattuned, uh, then the child still uses splitting. Then in his, then in his internal memory system, in, in the architecture of his subconscious or unconscious, in the endopsychic structure, in the internal theater where the blueprint is, where the, the script is, the schema, there's going to be a concept of the mother, uh, memories of the mother that's more rejecting than loving, and it's split there. So in the child's internal theater, right, it looks like a fairy tale, goddess and demon, it's split. And that's, that's, that's inner conflict. Yeah. 
It's not supposed to be like that. Splitting is meant to be existential hearsay by the age of three. And if splitting is still being used, one side's denied, when something's denied, it's projected. It means the person sees what he can't see about himself. And, and in order to do that, the person somehow attributes something about him that he can't accept and says that others have it. Others think it, others believe it, others want to do this, others think this, others do this and believe that. That's belonging to him, but he can't accept it. Yeah. So if the child felt shamed, um, he may say others are no good. Yeah. Because he can't accept how he as a child came to the false belief or the false conclusion that because of mother's misattunement that he was unwanted and hence no good. So he says others are no good to not face how he came to the false belief that he was not good, that he can't accept. It's all a misunderstanding. Of course the baby's good. But he but he came to this existential conclusion about himself when the mother was misattuned. The baby has a need. Why is the mother not responding? Did, did the baby do something wrong? Is, is, is there a problem? Is the mother rejecting him? Is the mother rejecting him but he but he must see the mother as good in order to survive but the mother's rejecting him so he comes to the false conclusion that he's no good yeah. then later on he says others are no good to communicate that he has this false conclusion in his unconscious yeah. now when he says others are no good um, that's called projection now to maintain the repression and the projection that goes with it he may coax the other, provoke the other, entice the other, taunt the other, get the other to demonstrate something that shows that they're no good or that they're flawed or something. Then he says, aha. Now, the more he can make himself um, trigger the other and say, aha, the more he can deny that it's within. So he gets his attention outward. In the last video, that's called centrifugal living or externalizing living or externalized living. Yeah. He doesn't have the eye. Yeah. The splitting, uh, that splitting model prevents the eye. He doesn't have his sense of self. Splitting precludes uh, the sense of self because he didn't leave the mother. He, he never differentiated from the mother. He's still in symbiosis internally with the mother. So he doesn't have the eye. So his attention is outward. Yeah. So uh, he focuses, uh, he focuses uh, very much outwardly to deny that what he's thinking and saying and believing about others is within in the last video we played that song called voices what are you looking for you're looking for yourself but it's so painful to find yourself but but you can when you look in the mirror and see that your projections are a mirror of yourself so the things we say about others most of it is about ourselves especially when there's strong uh, emotions, right? Um, so projection is a threat. Projective identification is a threat. Uh, splitting, mor the moral defense, where the baby says he's not okay, mother's okay. Negative magic gesture, repetition, compulsion, rationalization. Uh, these are when you create lies and excuses to hide and mask over uh, the more to hide the repression and the projection and the projective identification the repetition compulsion then then there's identification with the aggressor right? the baby felt exploited by the mother then he later in life exploits others to communicate that when he was a child his mother exploited him yeah. the child came to that conclusion that the mother exploited him when the mother didn't meet his needs. It's all a misunderstanding. The mother didn't know. She was simply on the phone for too long. The child didn't get it because the child has no concept of time. If he's hungry, he needs now. He can't, he can't think, oh, everything will be okay in five minutes. She'll get off the phone. And the child's terrified now. And so the mother's the aggressor. He can't handle that pain. Now, the more unavailable the mother is, uh, so the more painful the mother is, that means the more unavailable her love is. The more unavailable her love is, the more the baby needs her love. Then he clings to her. So much so that at some point, if it's so dramatic and so painful, he just becomes her. That's called identification with the aggressor. Then in later life, his unloved self, he sees onto others. 
and then is negative towards others to communicate that when he was a baby his mother was negative towards him and he's stuck like that in a script that's also called a narcissistic pattern but other patterns can engage in this dynamic as well so that's a major threat as well um, identification with the aggressor we have a threat on symbiosis the baby and the mother are fused but if the baby is loved he can differentiate if the baby's not loved he's still fused the main, and he'll be very angry about that yeah. that's a tar pit he, he's stuck in a negative tar pit with the mother his main emotions will be hate, greed, envy, spite, vindictiveness, schadenfreude. Um, the child needs love uh, to, to, lead, to differentiate from her psychologically. If he gets the love and he does differentiate, then we say that love and gratitude have entered the psychological picture. But if he's still fused with the mother and he's, he's even become her and then he's negative towards others, um, He's not really affectionate or caring or kind or anything other than I'm okay, you're okay is a sign of trauma. Anything other than I'm okay, you're okay is a sign of trauma. Prejudice is a sign of trauma. Um, um, in the beginning, the baby says, I'm not okay, mother's okay. Yeah. At the age of three, uh, it's I'm okay, you're okay. In normal, natural, healthy development. If, the ch if after the age of three, the child still thinks he's not okay and others are okay, uh, that's the codependent pattern, the clinger, the pleaser, and all that. But a more serious problem is prior to the age of 18 months, if the first 18 months was so painful, he can't, e he can't even accept that he was not okay. He gives himself up altogether and just identifies with the aggressor. Now, the aggressor, from the baby's point of view, was okay. He adopts that fake okay position for himself. Then he says that he's okay. okay. Now, the mother thought that the baby was not okay, from the baby's interpretation. But that's repressed, and it's seen outward. So that mindset is, I'm okay, you're not okay. So when the person says, I'm okay, you're not okay, he's talking about himself seen outward. Okay. So he's doing the same thing what his mother did to him. One author says, look, uh, that he's talking to his mother in the mind. Look, mother in the mind. You see this safe, peaceful, innocent person out there? Well, when I was a, a baby, I was safe, peaceful, and innocent to you. And you devalued me. Well, you see that safe, peaceful, substitute other out there? I'm going to do to them. I'm going to say negative things about them to show you. I'm going to show you through my behavior what you did to me. Okay, so he has this uh, hope that if he shows his mother in the mind what she did to him, he hopes that the mother will, that the mother in the mind will get will get the realization. Oh, is the boy angry at the mother? Did the mother do something wrong? Well, look, mother in the mind, there's an innocent person. I'm doing negative things towards them. That's what you did to me. And he hopes the mother might think, oh, I guess I did something wrong, didn't I? Now the baby hopes, or the person hopes, that the mother in the mind will change her ways and provide the person with the love they need so they can differentiate. But who is he talking to during this time? A memory, a ghost, a phantom. So it's not going to happen. But he's stuck there trying to get this ghost to change, the, <laughs> to change something. But the ghost can't do it. The ghost is just a memory. This ghost is not going to fly out of the person's mind, travel to wherever the mother is, get the mother to realize the mis uh, what happened. She picks up the phone and apologizes, and some healing takes place. Then he feels better, and then, he, okay, he got, uh, um, he got some witnessing, and uh, he got some understanding. He got his needs met. There was some reparation there. It's not going to happen. Nor is the mother in the mind, nor is that ghost going to, fly to where the mother is and instruct the mother to build a time machine and then uh, take the two back to the nursery. She becomes the young mother, the person becomes the baby, in, the baby in her arms and she breastfeeds properly and changes the past and he feels better. Try hop back in the time machine and he can't change the past. Right? But the person is angry at the symbiosis 
The baby's meant to leave the mother at the age of five months. In normal, natural, healthy development, between three and seven months, the baby begins the differentiation process. Klein says it can begin as early as three months. Mahler says on average four to five months. Uh, another author said it could happen as late as seven months. But if the child can't differentiate, that means he's stuck there. Why is he stuck there? He's stuck there because he needs the love to leave her. He's not getting it. So he's waiting for her. The baby is in a catch-22. He's loyal to the mother in the mind. He is her even, waiting for the love to leave her. But he's not getting it, so he's waiting for it. And he's stuck. He needs it to leave it. So he's waiting. He's not. So he's in a catch-22. He's stuck. And he's angry by that. He wants to leave. Right? So to express his anger, he doesn't have words for it. Right? He's going to demonstrate it through his behavior all of his life, what she did to him. Now, at the same time, this is for the person to realize that he himself or she herself is creating a mirror to recognize what the mother did to them. Then she herself or he himself can see what happened to him in their childhood. Then they go, oh my God, the reality, the mother was so misattuned. Did the mother use the bottle in the schedule? Did she make the baby cry at night to sleep? Did the mother was, was she, did the mother feed them when they weren't hungry, or did she not feed them when they were hungry? Did she punish them for not doing for doing nothing wrong, or did she reward them for uh, something they shouldn't be rewarded for? Like was, was the mother so chaotic and erratic in her um, right? Then the person has to. Um, um, do some do some research. They have to become their own existential detective. Now they think about the mother. Was the mother betrayed as a child? Did the mother experience intergenerational trauma where she didn't get a secure attachment herself? That means she's stuck in her negative magic gesture with her script, with her uh, traumatic script, with her schema, blueprint, internal working model, internal theater. She's still using splitting. She's using projective identification. She's trying to. She's in battle with her mother in the mind. So that means the mother, right, wasn't able to love her child because she wants to show her mother in the mind that she wasn't loved when she was a child, and she's stuck in battle with her. So the mother was caught, stuck, trapped in her existential net, her existential dilemma. She was stuck there. She was stuck in her repetition compulsion. It's a compulsion. She's trying to heal. So the mother is engaged in the repetition compulsion. It's like OCD or something. She's stuck in this OCD addictive or repetition compulsion, right? Because it's painful. Then it's like classical conditioning, they said. Now she's brainwashing herself into it. So the mother's stuck in this repetition compulsion. Now the positive intention of this repetition compulsion, okay? Repetition compulsion, OCD, that's a symptom of the mother not having memories of being loved by her mother. So she's trying to create some order and stability in her life. So she's she's obsessive compulsive, wants perfect order or something. It can't be done. But that OCD is to tell her that she doesn't have a, she doesn't have memories in her mind of being loved by her mother. Yeah. So um Okay, so OCD, this, so all of this repetition compulsion being reinforced through classical conditioning, being reinforced through the OCD mechanism of searching for security uh, to notice at the same time that the reason they're OCD addictive like is because they don't have memories of a loving mother. This repetition compulsion is the means, is the mirror, is the means of bringing the traumatic script to consciousness. So the mother doing these negative things, it's for her. Uh, the mother being rejecting towards her child, she needs to, she ideally would notice that she's being negative towards the child, that she has OCD, repetition, compulsion, negative. So if she can observe her own negative behavior towards her child, that's a mirror or a means for her to see how she was treated as a child. Okay. So now we see that the mother was stuck doing that, but didn't look in the mirror and realize it. Okay, so we are on the recipient end of the mother uh, trying to, uh, um, the mother was using the child as a prop in her uh, 
conflict with her mother in the mind. So now the person has to forgive the mother because she was stuck. Why was the mother doing this? Well, do some more existential detective. We have to be our own existential Columbo, Perry Mason, or Judd. Judd. That's one of my favorite uh, uh, detectives, uh, Judd. We have to be our own existential detective. Maybe the mother had prenatal distress syndrome. Maybe the mother, when she was in her mother's belly, went to a heavy metal concert and she was kicking around frantically. So if the mother, when she was in her mother's belly and she was kicking around, that, that didn't mean that she was physically strong and she was preparing to become a famous soccer player. Not at all. She was stressed out. And because of the stress, the cord might be wrapped around the mother and she's not getting oxygen and she's kicking out of this out of huge distress now if the mother was distressed in the womb then she was vulnerable to birth trauma if there were complications at the birth so maybe the mother did get birth trauma there could have been procedures there that led to the maybe the mother was removed from her mother when she was born that's birth trauma the mother, when she was born herself, she was expecting to be held by her mother. Okay. Um, the mother may have had other perinatal trauma. Uh, maybe uh, procedures did it. Uh, shock trauma at the dentist's office. Shock trauma while getting their tonsils out in the environment. Um, the, maybe they're in a, victims of the plunder system. You know. Actually, someone just talked about here on the news here. Um, the plunder system is about um, stealing everybody's, uh, preventing everybody from having food. And they're, they're, then they have a lot of stress by not having proper nutrition. Maybe the mother is getting stressed out from not having proper nutrition because of the plunder system. So the mother may be traumatized for a variety of reasons. Now we realize that the mother... Um, didn't have it to offer. That's the reality. That the mother couldn't do it. She would have if she could have. Of course, if the mother were loved. If the mother didn't have all of these uh, traumatic situations, uh, then she would have loved her child. So she would have if she could have. That's the positive side of her. And despite the fact that she couldn't, she probably tried her best and even in her attempts to try her best, uh, it may have been mixed in with her confusion about it. So there is a mixture of uh, the mother being loving partly, but maybe more so frustrating. Yeah. So then we um, work towards, um, okay, well, if the mother's stuck in the plunder system, well, that's out of her control, really. Now we have to look at the plunder system. And understand the broader situation um, then we start to forgive the mother a little bit if we can start to forgive the mother then we can look at ourselves when we look at ourselves we realize what the know thyself movement is all about the self-awareness movement the self reparenting movement the heal thyself movement the mythopoetic movement and other movements related to taking responsibility for our own healing. Um, we didn't cause all of these traumas, but it's our life and we're, we're respons each person's responsible for finding themselves. But where are they? Okay, Who they really are is in a bag that they drag behind us. So that's Robert Bly's metaphor. We lose our golden ball, our sense of self, it's like a golden ball and it gets put into this bag and we drag this bag behind us all of our lives that's the unconscious and we spend the rest of our lives trying to get it back so that's that's the journey to get it back that's what we're looking for so we're looking for our own golden ball in the bag now the golden ball is locked in a cage we need the key where's the key the key is under mother's pillow where's mother's pillow there is none mother's pillow is a symbol for forgiving her and seeing her as a whole person, both loving and frustrating. 
But if unconsciously we were so traumatized by her, we don't do that. We use splitting. So we have to heal the splits, meaning face the unconscious ambivalence, get that whole image. Then we find the key. Okay, then we get the golden ball. So that's the so we're looking, so it's an inner journey. China calls it the second journey, once upon a midlife. So usually around the middle years, we, we engage in this stories for the midlife traveler. This is a very good place to start the second journey of midlife. Chinin read 7,000 fairy tales, plucked out 50 of them that best represent the second journey. We have a thread um, in this uh, series of quotes called uh, The Psychological Interpretations of Myths and Fairy Tales. So again, that bag we drag behind us, all that, that's... We, this other world, it's like another world in there. It's a fairy tale world, a mythological world. Right? Myths and fairy tales are true on the inside. Yeah. They describe this inner world that we carry with us, that's a part of us. So we're trying to make the unconscious conscious. Um, hold on a sec. Okay. <laughs> so maybe we'll just uh, begin with um, today's quotes. So we have a um, um, Roughly 30 threads. Okay. And um, so in this uh, video, we'll add a couple of quotes to our thread on what's called object relations theory. Object relations theory, the study of the internalization of interpersonal relations. So the baby has an, originally the baby has an interpersonal relation, an external interpersonal relationship with their mother. All of this becomes internalized, and it creates a theater in there based on the memories, based on what happened. Was the mother misattuned? Was she attuned? Was she loving? Was she refusing? Was she taunting and then refusing? Uh, was she supportive sometimes? Was it conditional? And there's this whole internalization. Okay. So object relations theory is the study of the internalization of interpersonal relations. Now, in the internalization, okay, this is called the endopsychic structure or the architecture of the subconscious. We want to try to have a, it's like a map or something. We're, we're trying to, because th if it's traumatic down there, you see, that means the person's going to project a lot of this inner material onto the present and distort the present based on what's the pain in there. And then in the present, they're going to try to rework or relive or communicate this past situation because they're trying to heal it. There's this innate drive for healing. So they're going to project or see or attribute or think or believe that others are something that's inside because the person's trying to make themselves conscious of what's unconscious. So we look at what's called object relations theory. Masterson has a, a construct um, Masterson, um, one of our mentors in this series, James F. Masterson, he has synthesized um, all of the previous work on object relations theory and, ma and makes it more understandable. One of the constructs is that um, in this internal theater, so again, we live in two worlds, the inner world and the interpersonal outer world. So the vertical is the inner world, the, the horizontal is our interpersonal external world. But the, if it's peaceful in the inner world, if the baby had a secure attachment style, there's whole object relations. The image of the self as whole, the image of the other as whole, it's loving, it's differentiated, the person is calm. They have a holding interject, the internalized good object. They don't have OCD. If there's no internalized good object, they might have OCD. 
trying to create order and perfection and order because uh, to manage because they don't have that they're missing the the loving memories with the mother that calms them down the mother didn't soothe them through her misattunements so they might become a perfectionist woodman calls it she has a very good book called addiction to perfection it talks about this so in the internal ideally in the internal theater there's a there's a concept of the self that's whole not fragmented concept of the other it's differentiated it's like two tennis balls the, and the other is whole and it's mutuality there um, that's a safe peaceful situation um, that's normal natural healthy development with that the person has access to the real self and the capacities of the real self that's another thread in this series also by Masterson uh, about the capacities of the real self uh, I've recently discussed it in, in recent videos but if the internal theater if splitting is still there that's a that's we got to look at this we got to heal the splits the primary split is a memory of the mother who's partly sometimes loving linked to a part self-representation that feels loved and the emotion that links the two is a pleasant emotion and so the, there's a concept of it's called internal object so there's a self part self object well, that just means a cluster of memories around a certain theme of being loved so there's the part self um, representation that's loved linked to a part other representation that's loving okay now the, the linking at the, the the emotion that links the two is that the child feels uh, safe and loved and all that now now there's another side there's a memory of the mother that's uh, tantalizing and refusing frustrating and rejecting linked to a part self representation that had all this hope for a lot to get their needs met but they were rejected now if the rejection side if the mother what in the original interpersonal relationship if the mother was more rejecting than loving then then this split scenario exists right? meaning there's going to be a part other representation that's rejecting linked to a or emotionally unavailable or emotionally absent or mistuned or, or linked to a part self representation that feels shamed devalued unwanted unloved and so on right? So that's so the, the the linking affect between the part other that's rejecting and the part self representation that feels rejected is pain uh, hurt of course now that relational unit that's a relational unit right the part of the mother that's rejecting linked, linked to a part self that's rejected that's a that's a relational unit now this relational unit uh, Masters, Masterson's jargon is woru. The withdrawing, the mother was withdrawing. Unavailable. She withdrew her love. She was withdrawing. Some people say reject. I think Fairbairn says rejecting. Jacobson, I think she also says rejecting. Masterson said, well, it's too judgmental. Let's just say she withdrew her love. Her love was unavailable, right? M maternal libidinal unavailability it was unavailable so the mother withdrew her love the child right? so when the child needed the mother's love the mother withdrew it and the child felt rejected so let's so he calls it uh, the withdrawing object relations unit okay so the withdrawing object relations unit comprises of an image of the mother that withdraws her love okay when the child has a need she withdraws her love That's the misattunement. That's the that's when the mother was misattuned using the bottleness schedule. She withdrew her love. The baby didn't need that. The baby needed love. She withdrew it. We could say rejecting, but um, let's just stick with Masterson. So she that's called the withdrawing object relations unit, right? Remember the linking affect. Abandonment, depression, pain, scared, hopeless, helpless terrified angry shame the works right he feels it's it's miserable for him anguish 
torment um, the pain the baby's scared um, it, the Edward Munch drew the painting the scream it's like that the furies in the story of Arestia it's persecutory anxiety Klein says it's a really a miserable feeling for the baby to have his needs not met he feels like he's gonna die or something like if the mother's on the phone for, for five minutes the child thinks he doesn't know if the mother's gonna come in five minutes if he might think the mother's abandoning him and he's gonna just die of starvation or something he doesn't know in that moment the hippocampus hasn't come online the, the part of the brain that has time the concept of time hasn't kicked in yet so that's called wo ru wo ru the withdrawing object relations unit so keep that in mind okay now that other one that i mentioned at the beginning where the mother was loving and the child feels loved that relational unit is called ro ru ro ru it's the rewarding object relations unit because what happened because the pattern is if it's splitting because of the splitting the splitting takes place because of the following pattern when the child needs mother's love she withdraws now the child feels despondent and helpless and scared maybe at that point the mother's going to come in so when the child um so the mother is rewarding when the child feels down okay so first the mother rejects the child feels too much pain maybe he's crying like crazy in the bed or something or uh, then the mother comes so he was regressed he was crying he was in pain then the mother comes then the mother provides her love so that's called the rewarding object relations unit so the rewarding object relations unit uh, means that when the baby is distressed when he, he's feeling pain because he didn't get the love then the mother comes but when the child has a genuine wish and wants mother's love she with she's not available okay so the ch we, another way of saying it is when the child wants to become autonomous to be himself he's punished when he's um, scared and depressed and sick and all that because of being punished then the mother comes oh here's some chicken soup then the mother provides attention okay that's called the rewarding object relations unit now these two relational units uh it's flipped they they're sep they're separate okay so keep that uh, theory in mind okay so if this is in the internal model if this is um, inward okay, these two relational units keep that in mind uh, throughout these quotes that I'll now read okay okay um where's my pen here oh hold on oh i lost my pen oh well okay Okay. <laughs> Let me see if I can find my pen. Hold on a sec. Where did my pen go? Maybe I can use something else here. Hold on a sec. I know what's gonna happen when I finish this video the moment I hit the stop button I'll find the pen but uh, anyways let's just temporarily use this okay um, okay so keep those two relational units in mind for these quotes okay the wounding the wounding of the client in early childhood okay 
What often occurs is that the client becomes trapped in the symbiosis. Okay, so remember, another thing to keep in mind, the child is still fused with the mother. Remember, uh, in the first five months, the fusion is still there. The baby doesn't know where he ends and his mother begins. The breast is just there to serve him. Everything around him is just there to serve him. This is the extended womb environment in the first five months. Everything's there to serve him. Right? So he's one with the breast. He might even think the breast is a part of him, or it's just there to serve him, it's for him, is it a part of him? He doesn't, it's blurred there, he doesn't know. That's called symbiosis. Okay? So, okay, so keep that in mind as well. Okay? So we've got the relational units, Rho, Ru, the rewarding object relations unit. There's fusion there. The wo ru, the withdrawing object relations unit. There's fusion there as well. It's split, but there's fusion. Okay? The fusion, then it's split. So that's the key thing here. So, um, now the client with this interpsychic structure. Okay? Symbiotic. Now, if the therapist is not symbiotic, okay? The smallest non-symbiotic event with the therapist even a wandering thought can trigger a reaction okay so let's say so this this therapist here uh what's his name Tress? I forgot his name here tressan or something tressan david tressan i know nothing about him but he wrote a very good article summarizing masterson's work and i've provided a link a link to it is included So let's say the, the client has this in splitting problem, right, within. Let's say he's with his friend, or in the, this case with a the therapist. Now he may um, be involved in the ro -ru, the withdraw the rewarding object relations unit. He sees the therapist as uh, in a positive way, and he feels loved. Now, the moment the symbiosis is broken, click, he can suddenly think, uh, oh, he's withdrawing, now he feels devalued. Now, remember, something in the present can trigger the past. How did the baby feel in the past? He felt very scared. So some trivial little thing like that, some hyper-trivial little thing like that can trigger the original pain. Okay? So this, this is... Uh, um, in, in the Masterson's jargon, in his books, in his model, that's called uh, the borderline um, disorder of the self. That's his jargon for it. Okay. Um, okay. A hint of withdrawal destroys the bliss of the ro ru. Okay. Are we still recording here? Yeah, okay. Mm. All right, a hint of withdrawal destroys the bliss of the ro ru, the, the rewarding object relations unit. Okay, therapist is loving, he feels loved. Okay, therapist is uh, nice and he feels very good. All right, just like when he was a baby, the mother was there. When he was sick, the mother gave him chicken soup and he felt comforted. That was the ro ru. So he he was. He was coming from this place. But when he started to daydream or do something else or uh, answer the phone or something, then ushers in the misery of the abandonment depression implicit in the woe ru. Now he triggered the therapist answering the phone. That triggered the woe ru. Okay? The memory of when the person was a baby, they had a need, and the mother was withdrew her love okay so the so he had the ro ru okay and then the therapist did something it triggered the wo ru okay so this is the borderline now you have extremes he feels very good one minute one second later he feels miserable now the therapist is experienced as withholding the therapist is viewed as devalued you're no good right so now the therapist is no good. One minute he was great, next minute he was no good. 
he is devalued as much as he was idealized before. So in the Ro-Ru, he was idealized. In the Wo-Ru, he was devalued. There's the splitting, right? The narcissistic pattern, right? Um, so I'm, I'm going along. In this 1001 Windmills of the Mind, I'm going with Grotstein's understanding of the BPD. Yeah. So Grotstein explains the BPD as a fusion of the, the prior trauma of the hostile provocative attachment style where the child didn't get their symbiotic needs met at all and a blurring with the negative fusion with the mother where they where they where they have symbiosis but it's negative so there's a blurring of the negative symbiosis and no symbiosis so i'm calling that the swiss cheese version of the narcissistic pattern so bpd is the swiss cheese version of the narcissistic pattern if they're in uh, the ro ru that's the narcissistic pattern if there's something happens and they lose the they lose the symbiosis the positive the fake bliss babyhood bliss reenactment transference love thing then they go then they regress to an earlier panic stage now in the wo ru what he'll do is he'll identify with the aggressor and put the therapist down now he will be the rejector it's called passive into active. Now he's going to devalue the therapist. Where when he was a baby, he felt devalued by the mother. He's now going to flip it and devalue the therapist. That's called identification with the aggressor. Now after a while, um, if he, if he, the therapist says I'm so sorry and all that, okay, then he can click. He may flip back into the role rule. Now he'll be the compliant good child and he'll idealize the great therapist. He'll over idealize the other. Yeah. So. Um, that's my understanding of the BPD. Yeah. But this uh, internal working upper, uh, setup, uh, Masterson calls that the borderline disorder of the self. Okay. So when you're reading Masterson, uh, so I'm, I'm quoting Masterson now, so his jargon is this setup with the two relational units is called the borderline disorder of the self. Yeah. But I think this... Uh, but I think um, I'm with Grotstein where he says that BPD, see, Masterson doesn't use the term BPD. He just says the borderline disorder of the self. Yeah. Um, they get away from the BPD. So the BPD, so he, but he's describing the BPD, but he's not using the term BPD. Okay. Um, I, I'm going to make it more clear in the future. Okay. Um, so, this negativity continues until a fear of actual abandonment obtains, at which time the ro-ru is triggered. Okay, so we can flip back and forth. And the compliant search for the good mother once again takes precedence. This process may oscillate back and forth rapidly within the therapeutic hour. Okay, so they're very dramatic. One minute you're great, one minute you're hero to zero. There's this flipping back and forth kind of thing. Right, one minute he thinks you're great, next minute he's hating you so much, then he loves you so much, then he hates you so much. Okay, just like the BPD pattern. Right? Okay, now when did this happen? When did this setup take place? Okay, it, t it took place between 15 and 24 months, called the rapprochement stage of development. So, just quickly, the psychological birth of the baby doesn't automatically take place with the biological birth. The child has to go through a three-year process to reach the psychological birth. First, there's the symbiosis in the first five months. Then there's differentiation from five months to 15 months. And then from 15 months to 24 months, there's the rapprochement subphase. So during that phase from 15 to 24, uh, if, the tr if the fixation or frustration the child gets stuck there. He's frozen there. The mother's not giving the baby the needs, they, and they get stuck there. That can lead to this uh, setup. Okay, the BPD. I'm going to just say BPD, okay? So during the rapprochement stage or subphase of the separation individuation process, when the child returns to the mother with new skills and discoveries, now she may either affirm. She may either affirm this new autonomy with love and interest, or she may squelch it by withdrawing. Okay? 
See, there it is there, right? Emotional, that's emotional abandonment. Okay, so there's the emotional abandonment. The child had some new skills, new discoveries. Look, mother. And then uh, she withdraws. She squelches it. She squelched the baby's enthusiasm. Okay? Now, this situation, this latter condition, then this, this, this doing by the mother splits the child's emotional life between two complexes. Okay? The ro-ru and the wo-ru just described. That's the two complexes. Okay? Lots of emotions in the ro ru and lots of emotions in the wo ru. It's a two, very strong focus on these two things, right? All experience is shunted through one or the other of the complexes at a time when the child's ego is so immature that only primitive or immature infantile, you know, splitting, protective, primitive, they mean early on, that's what they mean, very early in the child's life, the jargon is primitive. That's what they mean in the, in the psychology jargon. When they say primitive defenses, they mean the things that the baby does. So that's early on in the baby's development. That's what they mean. They nothing to do with indigenous. I wish they would stop using it. But anyway, so we can change this word to inf immature or infantile, right? So babyhood defenses. Only babyhood defenses, early on defenses, that's what they mean by early on, right? Uh, are available for the purpose of avoiding pain. Okay, splitting, identification with the aggressor, the moral defense, splitting back and forth between ro ru and wo ru, right? And that's what the baby does to deal with the pain, right? All right, again, uh, the mother, the child returns to the mother with new skills and discoveries. She may either affirm this, this new autonomy, that's healthy development with love and interest, right? Communicative matching. She, she's okay with the child becoming psychologically autonomous, that's normal. Or she squelches it because she wants to keep the child dependent on her. Okay, So she squelches the child's psychological autonomy because the mother wants the child to be a mother for her. So she's forcing the child to be dependent on her. That, that allows the mother to have a symbiotic object to comfort her. So she wants to parentify the child. That's why she punishes his autonomy, to make the baby dependent on her. Right? So the baby, to deal with this pain, it's splitting. ro ru and wo ru wo ru Right? And then all experience then goes channel is channeled into these two, right? So the mother is pathologically clinging to the child. That's what what can create this. So what creates this is that the mother is pathologically clinging to the child. The mother is using the child as a symbiotic object to to mirror her. Because when the mother was a baby, she didn't have a secure attachment style with the mother. When she has the baby, she says, Aha, okay, baby, you're going to do for me what my mother didn't do for me. So she's going to arrange it, coerce the child to be attentive to her, to respond to her, to respect her, to be at her beck and call, to answer her, to say yes to her, to reply to her, to be there for her. In other words, she's trying to manipulate the child to be a good mother for her. So the mother is clinging to this baby. That's what causes the split between the, the, the splitting within, the ro ru and the wo ru. So the child learns that autonomy is punished by withdrawal. Okay, the mother can't accept it. She doesn't want to experience her abandonment. Because if the child becomes autonomous, that triggers her emotional abandonment. She doesn't want to be triggered of how she felt abandonment by her mother. If the child becomes autonomous, that triggers her abandonment. So to, as a defense against her being triggered of feeling abandoned when she was a child, she's going to make sure the child never leaves her. So to do that, she withdraws or punishes or rejects the child's autonomy. That means the child needs her even more. Right? That's how she is able to get herself to cling to the child um, and the child then is forced to need her even more. 
Again, from the very beginning, the more rejecting the mother is, the more the baby needs the mother. Now the child is forced to cling to her in, in reply to the mother's original agenda to get herself to cling to the, That's a negative symbiosis. The child is trapped, stuck in a negative symbiosis with the mother. So, that, so you can see the structure there. That's why he's going to be angry um, um, in later life. Um, he wants to differentiate from the mother, but he's stuck there. It served the mother. It serves the mother's needs. Um, it makes her feel good in the moment. It doesn't heal her. It doesn't cure her. It doesn't change her psychic structure. It doesn't work. No baby can be a mother for the actual mother. It doesn't work. But what the mother is doing is she's saying to the mother in the mind, look, mother in the mind, you see this baby here? You see how I tricked this baby to attend to me and take care of me? Well, I'm showing you what I needed from you. Don't you feel badly that I'm, I'm, I'm converting your grandchild to be my mother? Can't you change your ways and apologize and do it right? And then, then I wouldn't do this to my own child, your grandchild? Can't, can't. So that's what the mother's trying to communicate. That's the, the, the chaos in her mind. She's trying to uh, strongly find a way to get her mother to realize how, how painful they felt by her misattunement and by how the mother exploited them to meet her needs. This is called intergenerational trauma, the passing down of the insecure attachment style. To heal intergenerational trauma, one person has to stop, right? forgive the other, and then know what's going on, and then offer a secure attachment style to the child. Right? Um, so the child learns that he's punished when he's autonomous. Okay, so the child needs some kind of acceptance and support. Okay, if the therapist is manipulated by the client into providing an illusion of fusion, the analysis stops and a symbiotic situation ensues. This is the ro ru lived out. The client substituting the ro ru complex for life itself. So he's saying here, some clients go through life constantly addicted in search for this ro ru. They're just living out the repetition compulsion how if they're, if they don't if they feel defeated or disadvantaged, maybe someone will be nice to them. They go to the therapist, look therapist, I was damaged, will you be nice to me? Oh, they're living out the row rule. Okay, so the baby was sick, the mother gave chicken soup, he felt better. He's just trying to recreate that with the therapist. He's just trying to re-trigger the row rule. Now the therapist's job is to heal, help, is to guide the way to heal the splits through the mourning process. Not to not to enact out, uh, what's his name, Gittleson, he says uh, the therapist shouldn't collude and play the role of the rewarding mother and he's the compliant, the helpless child. Gittleson says, actors, that's for actors, we're therapists, we're trying to heal, we're not, to, we're not just going to be play act, that's, that's for the theater state, we're not, right? Therapists are not actors, we're not going to play that role of being the the mother who gives chicken soup to the kid. Yeah. Okay, next one here from Tresson. So what does the therapist do? The therapist confronts the client to make the person see that he is looking for the good mother and that this is destructive to his own sense of self and strength. The therapist also confronts the immature defenses that keep this repetition compulsion going. The, the denial, avoidance, rationalization, making excuses, blanking out from your feelings, and calls out the th the client on attempts to act out this row ru or this reunion quote reunion fantasies within or without the therapy uh, therapist hours therapy hours. Now the way out of both complexes, the way out of this splitting, is to stop looking outside himself for all of his nurturance. Okay, so the way out, the cure is to stop looking outside himself for all of his soothing. Okay, so that's the song we played in the last video. Can I refer you to the last video? We played the song uh, Voices by that rock band, uh, Cheap Trick. Uh, the lyrics, he says, you're looking for yourself. 
You didn't know what you were looking for until you found the voice of the voices of your inner child and you connect to yourself. We're going to end this video, if time permitting, with a poem to help uh, clarify that. Okay, so the voluntary giving up of this lifelong style um, is experienced by the client as a kind of sacrifice. That's a kind of sacrifice to give up this babyhood um, mechanisms, right? That's all he knows, right? If the right, if the sacrificial right, okay, he's being metaphorical here, is um, survived, of course it's survived, right? Of course there'll be anxiety to give it up. But if he, once he gets past that anxiety stage, there then comes the constellation of a self in harmony with the ego that will allow for the I experience, the self experience, the ontological self. So he found himself. Or who are we looking for? We're looking for the voices within. That's okay. So we're, with our inner, we're going to connect with ourselves. Okay. So when we heal the splits, and differentiate from the mother and say, uh, and say, I'm sorry, mother, uh, I can't continue in this manner. I, I know you need me, but I can't save you. Uh, I want to be myself. Okay. So now his move to, so he, him healing this, him understanding the mother, healing the splits, differentiation. Then he, then he gets the key out from under mother's pillow. That's the self experience and self determination, self agencies for the first time. Okay. So when you give up the ro ru and the wo ru uh, and you bring it together, then you get whole object relations and you find a self. Now he makes a point here. Let's let's be let's have some compassion for ourselves. Everybody struggles with this to, to one degree or another, and he ends up with the question: Who in his or her most intimate relationships can avoid being tossed back and forth between fears of engulfment? Okay, that's the role, yeah, fears of engulfment and fears of abandonment. That's sort of the, the split there. I've left the link, I've left the link. So these are just three sample passages from an excellent article by a guy named David Tresson. I know not, there's no other information about him. Um, so I've left the link there. He, uh, he uh, wrote a review for one of Masterson's books. His story is, first he studied one modality of healing. It didn't help. It didn't help. Then he studied another modality of healing. It didn't help. He studied another. It didn't help. Finally, he went to his shrink. He's a therapist himself. He went to his shrink. And his shrink said, okay, you got to read Masterson. He did, and it worked. So he, he's, he, he got it. He understood it. And he wrote a glowing, uh, very helpful, very helpful review um, of Masterson's book, one of his books. Um, so I highly recommend this article. It's not long, maybe five or six pages long. Um, um, the link is there. If by chance the link doesn't work, look up the author. Um, but, uh, and uh, the name of the, let's see if I can dig it up here. The name of the article is, well, it's just a review. Okay, so, okay, James F. Masterson. So the book is called Psychotherapy for the Borderline Adult, a Developmental Approach, right? So the 1976, reviewed by David Tresson. Okay, so he tells a story here. This is a great article. I highly recommend uh, this uh, article here, this review. It's, it's more than a review. It's actually, it's more of an article. Uh, this is great. This is the best review of Masterson's work that I've seen here. And he, ha he has this theory at the end that... Um, what about the feminine principle? Isn't it, isn't it the feminine principle that heals? Well, he says, well, you're in the therapy room. It allows the two people to calm down. The therapist is able to be an existential detective. And that brings up the feelings in him, 
in the client and the love there uh, is healing as well right? so the the interpretations help uh, free up the feelings and it's the feelings and the experience of the feelings that's the feminine principle so we want to get in touch with the yin within again i'll explain that with the quote at the end uh, the poet at the end so david tressen great job great article um, okay so we'll go back um we'll go back to our quotes here Another reviewer for Masterson's book uh, says this. The toddler, the tod the baby's, the toddler's individuation re rekindles. Okay. A separation reaction in the mother. You see? If the, to if the baby's going to become autonomous, that triggers the mother's separation anxiety. And then if that happens, the baby becomes fixated to this struggle okay the mother didn't provide support for his autonomy learning that individuation means withdrawal of mother's libidinal supplies okay that triggers the woe ru just described and regression then means uh, reward that's the ro ru as uh, the newly emerging self appears, so now when we heal the splits, as the newly emerging self appears, Dr. Masterson insists that the therapist provide communicative matching or reality-oriented discussion of emerging interests. So let's say, um, ideally, during the rapprochement subphase, so first there's symbiosis for the first five months, the mother's Un she unconditionally meets the baby's needs for safety and soothing and all that. No conditions, unconditional needs, no bottle, no schedule. It's according to the baby's needs and the mother's attuned. So the mother first provides the baby's needs to get their symbiotic needs met. From five months to 15 months, that's for mirroring. The child needs to see that, that he has the question in his mind that eventually he's going to separate and individuate from her. So he's going to practice with the idea of that. So he looks in his, into his mother's eyes. Hey, mother in the mind. Look, mother, actual mother. I'm eventually going to, I have this innate drive to be myself. Are you okay with that? So the mother looks with uh, pleasure and delight that the child is going to be themselves. And the child sees that. So he feels the green light to be himself. Now, between at 15 months, then the primary narcissism, the infantile megalomania, thinking it's all, all about him, because now he has he's achieved partial differentiation. Um, then the prime, then when there's di the more differentiation there is, uh, the less infantile megalomania there is. So he's starting, to, he's part way, in, he's midway in the process. So between, uh, let's just say, 18 months and 36 months, during that time, the child has new discoveries, new interests. Yeah? The mother is meant to provide what's called communicative matching. It's a kind of playful improv where the mother accepts even further. First, she just saw that it was okay. Now she's going to be more active in doing in her teaching. Then the child really gets the experience. So the child found, found a frog. And the mother opened up a book and taught the child about frogs. Wow, so he can, it's okay for him to have an interest in something that he found an interest in. So the mother supported and shared her knowledge about frogs by reading the book about whatever it is, and so on. Yeah. So that's called communicative matching. Uh, not too much, not too little, just enough that the child can understand. And then by the age of three, then he consolidates all of these memories of, of getting his symbiotic needs met, of getting his mirroring needs met, of getting his communicative matching needs met, then he has what's called the internalized good object. There won't be OCD if he has that. He has the holding interject. Okay, That means he, that means he can get the key out from under mother's pillow. That, that means that unlocks the cage and he gets his golden ball. And now he has the eye. It's called the ontological self. Now, when he has the ontological self, he has the, he has the self experience, the self determination, the self agency. Now, one of the benefits of all of having the self is that he then has a, some treasure. Um, he finds the real self part of the self. 
and there are various capacities of the real self. The real self, part of the self, has various, it has ten wonderful gifts for the child. And so after he gets the golden ball, he then has this treasure chest with ten wonderful gifts described by Masterson as well. I won't redo the ten gifts here. So we have a thread on the capacities of the real self, the aliveness of affect, a wide range of affect, mutuality. The marriages become like fine wine. They can have I statements. Um, they can, they, the child can know his interests and he feels okay with it. None of this f exaggerated feelings of being abandoned or engulfed by the other. None of this guilt feeling that he's going to hurt his mother if he bees, if he's going to be himself. None of this fear that he's going to, that the father's going to punish him because the father's jealous of him. None, none of these kinds of neurotic things from dysfunctional families. Yeah. So, um, because he had a secure attachment style, he, he's, he's emotionally liberated. Right? Um, he can express himself and not feel guilty. And that leads to a positive feedback loop. Again, with the poem at the end there, they talk about this feedback loop. If he expresses his real self right, from, his, from his ontological self, um, that's meaningful. Uh, he, get, he builds natural self-esteem. Then he can do it again. And it's a positive feedback loop. Right. Okay, another reviewer for one of Masterson's book uh, adds the following. Well... What about this healing process? Let's talk about the healing process. Okay, so we call out the defense mechanisms. Okay, so we call out, that's called confrontation. We call out the clients acting out, repetition compulsion, binge eating, whatever they're doing, this flipping back and forth, one minute you're all great, the next minute you're, you're no good, next, min, next minute you're so great, next minute you're no good. We're going to call some of this out and you're denying it, do you notice it? Now when we do the work of interpretation, and bring bring all of this to the their attention. Okay, this is going to bring up memories. Quote, awakening of memories. Okay, the therapist being a mirror and, and his presence and, and being aware of this, making this conscious, this is going to awaken memories. Okay, then you have dreams. Okay, now this becomes cyclic. Okay, okay? then more memories come. Okay, and then it goes deeper and deeper. Finally, the client recognizes his patterns and develops more coping behavior. He begins to separate from the mother, leading to more uh, early memories, and so on. As the client starts to separate from the, from the inner critic, the dream police, the policeman in the mind called the hostile mother ego, He's going to become, as he does this, there he's going to feel the woe rule, the anxiousness, the furies. He'll feel anxious, but keep in mind this is a normal phase of therapy. Okay. This is a normal phase of therapy. If someone brings something to your attention, it brings up memories. Put it that way. And you keep doing it, it brings up earlier and earlier memories. Uh, uh, that liberates you. Right? But in the process, there's anxiety. Right? Because you're not, not going to use the ro-ru anymore. You're facing the wo-ru. When you give up the ro-ru, uh, you're going to face the, the wo-ru. Okay? So Masterson's axiom is self-activation, healing, is going to trigger the woe rule. That leads to lots of anxiety. When there's lots of anxiety, then the chicken soup comes in. That's the woe rule. So you want to do something good for yourself. That's going to trigger the anxiety. That's the woe rule. You ban them at depression. That's lots. So when there's anxiety, we use a defense mechanism. Then we do something to soothe ourselves for the moment. That's the woe rule. So we were... were Ward, um, we do something to deal with the pain of being rejected from our self-activation. So the baby had an autonomous self-activation. It got rejected. Then, the, then he was defeated. Then the mother rewarded him. So this is all repeated in adult life. Self-activation triggers the abandonment depression or the woe-ru or the massive anxiety or the furies or the scream. 
Okay, the memory of the baby, of how the baby originally felt when, with the mother's misattunement and, re, and withdraw, withdrawal of her libidinal uh, supplies. Yeah. And, then that's, and then after all that anxiety, finally, what happened in childhood? The mother gave chicken soup. So we do something like binge eat or something like that. Okay. A key concept here, Masterson's axiom. Self-activation triggers the abandonment depression, which triggers defense. Okay. Or self-activation, real self-activation, triggers woe-ru, which triggers, which leads to the ro-ru. So we want to be aware of this. If we're aware of it, we're, we're bringing up memories, we're facing some of this. That's the working through grieving process. Right? It takes time to do that. Okay, I'll just leave it here for Masterson's work here. Um, he's really the, the key... Um, I would say Karen Hornai ultimately is maybe the, the, our lead mentor here. I would say Masterson's maybe the second one. Burglar might be the third. Our mentors are Ma James F. Masterson, Karen Hornai, Edmund Burglar, Melanie Klein, William Fairbairn, and Margaret Mahler. Robert Bly makes a sort of guest of appearance as well. Um, another quick look here. Yeah, it's getting dark early here today. More rain, okay. Oh, there's the crow. I don't know if you can see them. There they go. Okay, it's two of them. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's funny, as I was standing at the window, I was just reminded of a news clip that was kind of a little, little bothersome. Then I saw the birds and I felt better. And then I sat down I thought, what should I do? Should I go back and address what was bothering me? Or um, just go with the feeling that I felt better because I saw the birds? And I felt a little guilty because I want to, part of me wants to address this serious issue. A part of me says, stick to the quotes. Um, what I'm referring to in my mind is that we have a thread in this series on the psychodynamics of prejudice. So we talk about uh, with the if something's repressed, it gets seen onto others. Okay, if the person projects the unloved self, their own unloved self, onto innocent others, and they identify with the aggressor. They think they're okay and others are not okay. So prejudice can come from that. Now at the same time, because of the fusion, when they devalue others, they felt that they were just devalued by the innocent person. They just devalued because they saw the other as the devaluer. Yeah. Because they are the devaluer and it's, it's fused there. So that, in other words, they're negative towards others and they always feel like a victim by the innocent other. And they're not aware of it. So prejudice can come from some of these psychodynamics. Or they just, or in a simple way of saying it is, the rejecting mother imago image in the mind, they see onto innocent others, and they say how terrible they are. They're trying to say to the mother in the mind, look mother in the mind, you see how I think so badly about that person? Well, in reality, when I was a baby, I wanted to say those angry things to you, but I couldn't, I didn't have words for it. My vocabulary didn't come in yet. Now I have it. Now I'm going to show you. So those my angry thoughts about this innocent person, that's how I really feel about you. Do you get it, mother in the mind, that I'm really angry at you? I know it's delayed, but I want you to change your ways and provide and apologize or something, and make reparation so you can stop doing this. He's stuck there. So prejudice can come from that. Yeah? Or he sees his unloved self onto others. He identifies with the aggressor. Look, mother in the mind. You see how how I'm acting negative or saying negative things about them? Um, I'm showing you what you did to me. So prejudice can come from some of these things. And then with the projection, there's coaxing. Okay, the coaxing. Now remember, remember in splitting, you only see one side of a story. You reject the other. Right? The splitting preserves the repression. 
they can't handle two sides of anything. They, they only can uh, like the, like the splitting here. Um, so in prejudice, it's always one sided. The others no good. They're good, and others are no good. No, it's one sided. They can't see that the one they think is no good is good, and they can't see themselves as having doing something wrong. It's either idealized or devalued. It's the wo ru or the ro ru. It's, it's this splitting thing that's going on. So prejudice comes from a lot of this uh, splitting mechanism. Splitting leads to repression. One side is denied. When that, that side that's denied is seen onto others, then there's coaxing to get that demonstrated. Right? If the person feels shamed, they want to see others shamed. It doesn't work. You can't shame others and think that you're going to get rid of your memories of being shamed by the mother. It doesn't work. No. This behavior is a mirror for them to see that they were shamed by the mother. If they're shaming others, that means they are meant to notice that they were shamed themselves by the mother. They're doing to others what the mother did to them for them to see what their mother did to them. So prejudice can come from some of these psychodynamics. And there are a few other aspects to it. Now, we have a sub-thread um, on the sociological side that contributes to uh, the prejudiced personality. I won't redo the whole thing here, but part of it is that 10,000 years ago, um, so for 150,000 years, all babies got a secure attachment style. That was the feminine principle, the yin, the feminine. Uh, I'm okay, you're okay. All babies got a secure attachment style. The temperament of humans for 150,000 years was calm, was mature, was adult, was caring. Uh, uh, there was no sardonic humor and all this splitting and lying and sarcasm and black humor, dark. There wasn't this, all this awful and prejudice wasn't really there. There might have been some jealousy, but there was no envy. This envy and this this exaggerated uh, goddess and demon mentality, these kinds of things weren't there. But then 10,000 years ago, we discovered uh, farming and agriculture. That gave humans a huge surge in serotonin to the brain. And then, and then the brain, the theory, is wire, wired around it. Now, when we don't get something that gives us serotonin, again with the serotonin, so dopamine for the chase, serotonin from the catch. When we caught, right, so the, the discovery was like chasing something, and then you, you discovered something, so we caught the discovery of the, the farming, we got all the serotonin, we felt safe. So serotonin is the chemistry of uh, I feel good because I feel safe from the mammalian brain's point of view. So 10,000 years ago, we got a huge burst in feeling safe. Um, we were unaware of what it did to our brains. We Maybe some elders knew, I don't know, but we were, over, we were way overwhelmed. Maybe in modern times, what if everybody automatically got a trillion dollars instantly everybody got a trillion dollars it might be like that and you got so used to that you know um, maybe maybe something like that happened in the brain back then so they got a huge burst in serotonin and they got used to it now what if there's a weather problem they panicked because then they might not get what they're so used to because they got addicted to that high level of serotonin. Just like how a person in present time might get addicted to being a trillionaire or something. I don't know. It's an approximate. These are it's an approximate. I'm just trying to, it's an approximate analogy. Um, so ten thousand years ago, um, people got all of this uh, food. We felt safe, it was great, but then there was a weather problem. Then we panicked. Then we decided we gotta grab and pill now they're greedy right they've got to plunder and pillage because they're so scared now when they're so scared they panicked they don't think clearly um, they want to get what they got that gave them the serotonin so that led to the panic and the manic greed and, um, now they thought to themselves well how are we gonna plunder that means we got to disadvantage some people to do all of the work to hand over to once to the, the people most distressed by it so that was the birth of the prejudiced personality. Because in order to plunder, you need a prejudiced personality. Right? So we went from global village with a tolerant, healthy personality. And then we started, we started off with the prejudiced personality, with the pillage. 
So they thought, how are we going to pillage? Well, we got to create the prejudiced personality. How do you create the prejudiced personality? Because you need, the prejudiced personality means us and them. Me good, you no good. So that's the prejudiced personality. How do you create that? Nobody has it back then. Back then, everyone thought, I'm okay, you're okay. There was tolerance. There was affection. There was uh, kind people. The temperament was like a mature, loving adult. A caring, kind, warm, safe, loving. There was no fear. With Nobody felt afraid. There was the general temperament for 150,000 years were... Um, a kind of relaxed, uh, playful, um, warm. Wo they were warm-hearted. They were warm people. They were loved. They got a secure attachment to themselves. So they were loved, and they gave their children the love. And they were warm. When children are warmly loved, their crave, their their play is creative and cooperative. It's playful. Their a lot of humor. The the humor is sweet. It's playful. It's not. There's no Schadenfreude there. There's no sadism or sadistic humor there. I put you down, ha ha ha, I'm one up. I feel, there's none of this, that's an illness. That's schadenfreude, emotional sadism, that's an illness. That's a real severe, very severe trauma in the brain, addiction to serotonin. There wasn't that there. So the people thought, um, people are so tolerant. How, how do we change this? We're in this panic mode to plunder, but no one wants to plunder. How are we going to plunder? So somebody got the idea quote suffer the children so when the babies were born don't hand it to the mother remove them that's that's a shock trauma they identify with the aggressor they're going to compensate for all that shame they're going to be the shamer that leads to the us and them okay um so all these people were shock traumatized with the removal of the mother the mother was obviously upset by it um that created the soldiers, I guess, or whatever it is. Um, the prejudiced personality. Now they go out and get others in a disadvantaged position, so they create a pool of poorly paid workers. Um. Now, every, now the psyche is always trying to heal trauma. How do we entrench this? How do we make it more... How do we preserve the prejudiced personality because we want to preserve the plunder? How do we preserve the prejudiced personality? We don't want people to heal and become tolerant and loving and normal. We want this aberration out of the panic, out of the confusion. So we, we invented religion. Religion promotes the use of primitive, sorry, infantile, immature defense mechanism. Religion promotes this primitive... Uh, immature infantile uh, defense mechanisms religion promotes the prejudiced personality the prejudiced personality is constructed by splitting identification with the aggressor projection projective identification reaction formation at uh, the fusion the symbiosis is still there and, and so on so the okay now religion promotes the prejudiced personality by encouraging the ongoing use of infantile of those defense mechanisms. Religion says to people, use splitting. Just think God is a demon. Don't question it. Don't realize that that's a metaphor of a traumatized psyche of, of a baby being traumatized by the mother. Don't think in that. Don't think. Don't add psychology. Don't add conscious psychology to your. Just engage in the. The babyhood way of thinking and goddess in the internal theater, right? The ro ru, that's like a goddess. The wo ru, that's like a demon. The, the religion says, just just think about goddesses and demons, just keep it like that. Then you then you disadvantage others, but you feel like the victim. Oh, do you feel like the victim hurting others? You hurt others and you feel like the victim? Oh, just fantasize a, a goddess in the sky, a good breast in the sky, and be one with them. Fusion, one with them, fusion. Because the symbiosis is still there. You see, so religion was used to uh, like a machinery to for the plunder system. Religion is a adjunct or a mechanism to promote the pillage. You see, and then for the past ten thousand years, we've had the prejudiced personality. Right at the time of posting this video in the year of twenty, what are we? Twenty twenty two. At the at this time. You know, I'm sure there are many reports out there that describe the state of affairs of 10,000 years of pillage and plunder. Right? The food is very damaged. Um, 
the, the plunder system is still taking place. If you listen to that song by Bruce Coburn called Stolen Land, he says the plunder system is still taking place. I just saw a distressing video this morning. I won't, I'm not sure if I'll play it or not, but um, he described the current plunder system where you block off every opportunity for millions of people, even billions of people, or lots of, to not have access to food and water. Um, then, they, uh, then they get sick from malnutrition. And every day, 30, every year, 30, every day, 30,000 die from starvation, and malnutrition, and poverty. So the plunder system is creating all of this immense poverty Right? To the point where now, in the year 2021, billions of people live on a mere $60 a day. They don't have much of a life. They're just hanging on, and they do all the work. Right? And to, to motivate them, uh, they, the plunder system creates conditions. They call it sanctions. Uh, I just learned today it's called uh, the, the Caesar method or something, where you surround a... You surround an area, and everybody in that area, think about the reservations with the indigenous people. You, so you surrounded them and blocked off their food. Then they get sick, and, and they're having all these problems. They can't even get clean water, and they're getting ill. And there's all kinds of social problems now. With these, right? So this, this, uh, this incentivizes the survivors. Okay, they'll work for poverty wages to stay afloat. It's an awful, cruel, inhumane Thing. it's it's a blind it, it's people got blinded uh, with the brain chemistry out of the confusion out of the panic t that started 10,000 years ago um, but before 10,000 years ago um, there was what there was what was called uh, the feminine principle was in charge yeah. so the feminine principle led us our feelings first and then we do something in reference to our feelings, in harmony with our feelings. But 10,000 years ago, the feelings got squelched, gone, just panic. So it's just manic panic. Right, so we're acting, um, it's an aberration. And there's been this call all along. For the past 10,000 years, we got to heal, we got to heal. So Socrates said, know thyself. Um, Mr., uh, Mr. Tao yeah. The guy that wrote uh, the Tao Te Ching, Lao Tzu, his name is Lao Tzu, 6,000 years ago, um, he wrote some poems to help people heal. And we're still using these poems. They're still providing hope and healing. Yeah. Lao Tzu. Um, so we'll end uh, this video with one of his poems. And, and there were all sorts of philosophers during the past 10,000 years um, Africa, Asia, all around, and then in Greece, I guess they had uh, uh, all those poets, uh, the people who wrote um, Homer and the Odyssey, and, and uh, the guy who wrote the Arestia story, and uh, I think Dante. Um, Ibsen, Ibsen, the story about Peer Gint. Peer Gint, Peer Gint was unloved. He became a manic, greedy person. Just the plunt, part of the plunder system. He was just greedy. He wanted to be the head troll. People with the narcissistic patterns are called trolls. At one point, he considered he tried to become the king troll, the head of the plunder system. Because all he had is the narcissistic pattern. All he had is the manic defense to stay away from the shame. Right? All of his energy, all of his ac aggressive activity is to keep him away of the original woe ru, the abandonment, depression, the shame, the massive anxiety. To heal this, we use these quotes and theories and poems, yeah, literature, good literature, and um, these ideas to weave the basket. We're healing ourselves by weaving this basket. Again, psychoanalysis always looking for an egg in a basket that's missing. So if we build this basket through these poems and quotes, and theories and models, 
Object relations theory is a good one. Developmental theory is a good one. The Masterson approach, which, which synthesizes the two, I think it's a great one. Bergler's approach, very helpful. Karen Horney, very humanitarian, full of heart, full of love. Uh, her writing is, is healing. If you just read Karen Horney, that's helpful. There's the whole mythopoetic movement of providing psychological interpretations of myths and fairy tales. In this, we have a thread in this area. We did, uh, we have Arestia, we have uh, the Odyssey, Iron John, and uh, we recently did um, Prometheus, and um, we did one with uh, the Mr. Noah there recently, and a few others. And we did a couple from Chinin. We did some quotes from Chinin's work. Uh, and we'll add some more psychological interpretations. Uh, absolute required reading. This comic from 1955. Right? I've mentioned this numerous times. In 1955, four issues were put out of this comic. This is a demonstration of the therapy process put into comic form. Two years ago, they bundled these four issues up into this book, also available online for only $20, a great deal. There are 12 therapy sessions throughout the whole complete series. Uh, four sessions with Freddie, three with Ellen, and five with Mark. Tales of Inner Turmoil. These people on the couch, they are trying to heal their memories. They are trying to be, they're trying to witness their patterns. They're trying to heal unconscious guilt, Call out, call out denial, repetition compulsion. They are unpicking the threads of a traumatic script to weave a new healthier script. Okay, we learn about we learn about family systems ther theory. We learn about transference, unconscious guilt. This is jam packed with psychology. Okay, people searching for peace of mind through psychoanalysis. This is this is excellent. This is this was part of the mental hygiene movement from the fifties. And they brought it back. Um, yes, it's dramatized a little bit, but not to the point where it's just some distracting entertainment. This is educational. So, um, I think I only have 15 minutes left uh, for storage reasons. So let's uh, do our last quote here. Our last quote here is also from Masterson. He talks about uh, the, teen the adolescent syndrome. Adolescent turmoil part. Yeah, sometimes called the adolescent syndrome or adolescent turmoil. His point was If a teenager at the end of high school, he's gonna leave high school if there's a lot of chaos going on um, It could be due to psychic structure Not just through this ordinary phase of leaving school and having some anxiety entering into the new world Usually it shouldn't be like that right? if it is very chaotic in high school uh, it's because, usually it's because of a uh, psychic structure. The, the ro ru and the wo ru is still going on. The splitting is still going on. So his advice was, at the end of high school, you have to identify who, which of these high school students still has this ro ru and wo ru going on. Heal that. Because if you don't do it then, it's going to haunt them the rest of their lives. It can. Yeah. So... Um, you want to catch it. He says very rarely um, is a teenager just going through some kind of adjustment phase. It's, it's minimal. So here's a quote from him here. Okay, the symptomatic adolescent is believed to step to the symptomatic. Okay, so this is the, the, the dysfunctional high school student, right? The problematic high school student failing in his studies and acting out and we know the type right the symptomatic adolescent is believed to step to a different drummer only temporarily under the surge of the adolescent growth process okay the transition between boy to adult there's this uh, spurt and growth called the adolescent growth process okay? however the music to which these adolescents stepped in his study there was not a transient melody orchestrated by growth and development, but a persistent and pervasive 
symphony arranged by repetition compulsion of childhood traumatic scripts. Their somber cadence pursued these clients through their adolescent years into adulthood. Adolescence was just was but was only a way station. Okay, and it brought it up, right? The decisive influence were these scripts, not adolescent turmoil. Okay, so for these dysfunctional teenagers, it's not adolescent turmoil. It's it's the traumatic script. Okay, it's the psychic structure. Damaged ego, lack of uh, holding introject, right? We found that the predominant influence of, quote, adolescent turmoil, okay, was only to trigger or exasperate and give its own particular coloring to previously existent troublesome scripts. So in other words, the adolescent uh, transition period just brought up what was hidden, in other words. All right, the therapeutic encounter may be very important at this time. Okay, because in the last stage of development, okay, meaning the end of high school, that's the sort of the main last stage, uh, 18, 19, or whatever, right? Uh, the traumatic script, if he doesn't heal it, then this script will plague him in some way for the rest of his life, unless there is a successful therapeutic intervention. And uh, I, you know, this uh, adjustment reaction to adolescent, well, I only reserve this category when I can clearly see it and clearly define it. Otherwise, I assume it's psychic structure. Yeah. So most of the time, if the teenager is very chaotic, uh, it's not just a phase. Sometimes, yes, but a lot of times, no. So the, his advice was, we got to identify the two. Acknowledge the two. Don't just automatically say that all chaos at the end of high school is due to this little growth spurt phase and look at over it. Uh, some yes, some no. What about the ones where it doesn't take place? For those ones, it wasn't that phase that caused the problem. That phase just brought up the hidden script because of the anxiety of leaving the school. It brought up the abandonment depression. The woe is triggered when they leave high school. So they act out and panic and make fault, faulty decisions and so on. Okay, uh, the poem I promised. I like this poem. Um, I have to do a few different versions of it because um, no sign of the pen, huh? Okay. Okay, here's the poem. It's uh, poem number 28 from the, the Tao Te Ching. Know the male, know the masculine principle, know the yang, okay, know the doing, but keep to the feminine principle and thus be uh, uh, someone who can uh, accept your feelings, all right? So know the male, but keep to the female and thus be a valley to the world, he says. When one is, quote, a valley to the world, the constant virtue will be there for you. Okay, no consciousness, but keep, but be aware of your shadow, and thus be a role model uh, to your family, to the community, to the world. If one is a, mo a role model in their environment, then constant virtue, right, of being in touch with your feeling self, this flow—that's the valley, the river valley to the okay, will will not will will always be there for you. Right? Yes, you can know some uh, uh, things, glory, you can have some material success, I guess, but keep humble, stay connected to your soul, right? and so be the valley to the world. If one is a valley to the world, then constant virtue will be sufficient, and you will return to your original state. With trauma, uh, people become tools, so um, so don't tra so don't traumatize your child. Okay, another another rendition here is um, 
He puts it this way here. By knowing the masculine and keeping in touch with the feminine, we are of use to the world. By being of use to the world, we are true to our original nature, okay, as if we return to our uh, the innocence that we were born with. So when we're born, we're given uh, special feelings, right? Um, by seeing clarity, okay, you also acknowledge what you don't know. So something you know, but stay in touch with what you don't know. Okay, stay in touch with what you don't know. And then you're a role model. Serving as a role model, you have integrity. Okay, even if you're praised or you lose, okay, remember your faults. And, and stay in touch with the feminine. Okay, the feminine leads. By being receptive, uh, your true nature, that's your true nature. And we return to our natural state. Okay, um, Okay. when there's trauma, then traumatized people might become tools. All right. So it's best not to traumatize. Okay, another one here. Okay, this is Le Guin here. Ursula Le Guin. Knowing man and staying woman. Okay, that means knowing the doing, but staying in your feeling. Okay, so... You know the doing, but you stay in touch with yourself. That's staying, that's the feminine. You stay with your feelings, okay? That's, 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 he calls this being the riverbed of the world. You're a role model of the, the, the feelings. See, the feminine principle, that's uh, emotion, that's water, that's the river. And you're the bed, that's the, you're holding your feelings. Being a riverbed, uh, now you have uh, your internal source, right? The soul is its own source of renewal, okay? It feels like uh, like when you were born, you were given all these uh, feelings, right? Knowing consciousness, but stay in touch with what, with what you don't know about yourself. Okay? Be an example for the world, right? A role model. Be a positive pattern for the world. Being a role model for the world um there's your uh inner integrity okay now knowing glory uh staying modest could be the valley of the world okay so that's the you're you're connected to the eternal spring and so on and he says here um don't traumatize the children so um my humble rendition of this for the moment is this um, here. In other words, know the doing, but keep to feeling and thus be a source to yourself. When one is sourced from within, constant virtue is there, just as it was there from conception. Know the mind, but keep to the heart and thus be a role model to your family. If one is a role model to their family, then this constant virtue will always be there. Know your defense mechanisms, but keep to the inner life that's being defended against. Wounded people express what happened to them and find outlets. So, a happy child is raised without shame. A happy child is raised without intergenerational trauma. Something like that. That's just my first draft of it. I want to I wanna come up with a psychoanalytic uh, way of describing poem number 28. Poem number 28. Okay, the Tao Te Ching. So one version of it is here in this, this book here. Let's see. What does he say here? Let's see if I can get some better light here. Is this better? No, hold on. Okay, he calls it here. The fusion of opposites. To know the masculine and be true to the feminine is to be the waterway of the world. Okay, so to know 
that you're someone who does, who acts, right? And to be true to the path with heart, to the feminine principle, this is to be like a river to the world, okay? This is to be like a waterway of the world. To be like a river is to flow with great integrity, always swirling back to the original gifts uh, from childhood. In other words, to know Yang and to be true to Yin is to echo the universe. To echo the universe is to merge with the great integrity, ever returning to the infinite. Wait, hold on. <laughs> Put the page here. To know praise and to be true to the lowly is to be a role model for the planet. To be a role model for the planet is to express the great integrity as the primal simplicity, like an uncarved block. When the uncarved block goes to the craftsman, it is transformed into something useful. But the wise craftsman uh, is very careful about this because he follows the great integrity. In other words, you don't want to traumatize. He's got a commentary here about it. You see, this one here, this third part here. Yin, well, this is why I'm quoting this here. Yin predominated during the Neolithic era of communal matriarchal tribes. Our own aged, our own times, okay, our own age, 10,000 years, turned all this upside down. Throughout recorded history, our civilizations have been uh, aggressively male-dominated, competitive, destructive, right? The plunder, pillage, right? And ruled by those uh, who were most traumatized by this, right? The, ruled by those with the prejudiced personality. How, how much more critical it is for us today to understand and to follow Lao Tzu's advice, exclamation mark, not to follow it in his, not to follow it in his time led to great unhappiness, not to follow it in our time could lead to even more uh, losses of species. All right, we're losing all kinds of species already. So he was saying, when the plunder system began, the law, this book was around 10,000. No, not this book. This book came afterwards. But this philosophy was around in matriarchal societies. The yin dominated for 150,000 years. I'm not sure how old this uh, book is, but at some point, um, this, this is, this is uh, the healing... Um, this is the natural way. Yeah. We can summarize it with the phrase, a path with heart. You have the path, yes, that's the masculine, that's the yang. A path with heart. What you're doing is serving, is from the heart, it's for the heart, it's serving the heart. Right? Now the heart is the adult personality, the tolerant personality. The heart is, I'm okay, you're okay. Love your wounded neighbor with your wounded heart. Recognize that everybody's traumatized. Recognize that everybody came out of the womb too early and received imperfect love. And we're coping with the pain of that by using defense mechanisms. So notice the defense mechanisms. Notice that they're being used to deal with pain. No. No. So I'll follow up on this one here, 28. So um, just two minutes, two, three minutes, a couple minutes left here. So we'll end up with a, a song here. I hope some of this has been of help. Um, Masterson's book, I highly recommend The Search for the Real Self by James F. Masterson. That's a great place to start. Karen Horney's book, Our Inner Conflicts, is another great place to start. Um, you know, online, there are dozens of um, translations of the Tao Te Ching. It's very interesting to read um, different, the different translations of them. Yeah. Um, so I read here, uh, I think I read three or four this time, of 
number 28. The number 28 means the, the reunion with the self, that's the feelings, that's the yin, and then the doing, yin leads, yin is the leader. The doing is just uh, how we express the form of expressing, serving, protecting the yin kind of thing. If the yin is missing, uh, then there's this panic and manic and plunder and pillage and all. So we want to get back to yin. Okay, so that song yesterday by uh, the Voices song, we're looking for the inner child, the the, reu the the connection to ourselves, to return to ourselves. Who are we looking for? We're looking for ourselves. When we find ourselves, right? Now we feel. We feel, therefore we are. That's great. That's I'm okay, you're okay. Because when we feel, then we realize uh, we're a homo, we're a person, and they're a person. Yeah. Okay. Um. Let's see. What would be a good song to end on this um, rainy day? What's this one here? Hold on a sec. Okay, um, let's see if I can choose a, a song for this uh, rainy day here. <laughs> a lot of good songs here, yeah. Nazareth, enough love. How about that one? All right. Dan McCafferty is one of our musical voices in this collection. This is him singing his song, Enough Love. He says in the song, he got enough love. And uh, he accepted it. Okay, so thanks very much. We talked about, in this video, we um, talked about the ro ru and the wo ru Interesting theoretical construct. When the baby's traumatized, he splits his concept of his mother as to rewarding or withdrawing, loving or refusing. And he keeps them separate. Then he projects, he denies one and projects the other. When he projects one, he denies, you see? And that's linked to self-representations. The rejecting mother and the rejected self, that's a relational unit. This relational unit can get projected into the present. The, love, the, the other unit can also get projected into the present. And they're very opposite. One is based on idealization and feeling love. The other one is based on how bad the other person is and feeling shamed. And a person can oscillate between the two. The idea is to he heal the memory of the mother, uh, the experience of the mother by witnessing the splits so we can bring it together. We bring it together when we forgive the mother. Then the internal theater is those two part images of the mother, they come together to form a whole image of the mother. Along with reparation of the other, leads to reparation of the self. So the two split images of the self, the part self that feels rejected, the part self that feels that we bring it together to a, an image of the self that's whole. So we want two tennis balls. Maybe the child at the age of three says, I got enough love now, I can be himself. Okay? At the age of three, the child says, I got enough love, I can be myself, I can be autonomous. So this song is saying he got enough love, he can be autonomous. Man's main task is to give psychological birth to himself if he didn't get it naturally by the age of three with a secure attachment style. Okay? So through the understanding and the psychotherapy work or whatever books he read, he got enough love and he found himself, let's say. 
and his music changed accordingly. Huh? I'm glad we did this video. It's a, it's, it's a, it sounds, again, like Robert Bly says, forgive psychology for its jargon, just forgive it. I highly recommend the article. I would say read that article and then read The Search for the Real Self by James F. Masterson. And then read that borderline book, the 1976 book by Masterson. Read those three. I think that's a great way to start. We talked about the adolescent one. Maybe I can do just a quick preview for the next video. I just discovered a new uh, author here, a new psychoanalytic author uh, called uh, G Gittleson. I don't know much about him. But in the next video, I'll just keep talking until this video runs out. In the next video, I'll do some of his quotes here. Removal of infantile amnesias occurs in analysis, but it is most often a result, not a cause of the cure. The infantile amnesia is removed. That's, that's a, an outcome of the work. That's the egg. That's the egg. When we build a nest, Part of the egg is the removal of infantile amnesia. If we don't remember so much of our childhood, um, you see, if we get some of those memories back and it's part of our narrative, it's part of our self, we, you see? So we shouldn't say that the cure is to remove infantile amnesia. Infantile amnesia is a sign that a cure has, ta that a cure has taken place. Right? You don't want to just remove symptoms. You want to heal what's causing the symptom, in other words. This association is a symptom. Right? If the person is no longer so disassociated, that means he healed his inner complex. The past is often used as a rationalization for the present. The client doesn't need your chicken soup. They need your understanding. Interesting one. The, chi the, client, didn't, the, the client doesn't come to see the therapist, oh, give me some chicken soup and trigger the row rule. They don't need, they need, the under they need the interpretations to heal the splits. If the client is just looking for the chicken soup, that's called supportive counseling. They're not, uh, they're just trying to get through an emotional period. They're not trying to heal. They just want to get better for the moment. Um, so the religion can do that. They have the fantasy, be f reunion fantasy of the fusion with the breast mother in the sky. Then you feel a little better. That's like a chicken soup kind of thing. You have that fantasy. Put your money in the bo box, you know. But get getting so back to the basic question: Do you just want to feel better for the moment, or do you want to heal and get better? Um, so we'll talk in the next video, I'll talk a little bit about the hysteric, yeah, about transference neurosis. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about, uh, yeah, the repetition compulsion, yeah, the transference. And um, about the teenager one, yeah, that last one there. Blows, writing about college students, states that ego inadequacy is the object of his therapeutic effort and not the infantile conflict he also emphasizes that the therapist must avoid in his in his attitudes toward the client a repetition of the parental pattern so no more chicken soup no more punishment for your autonomy okay but if uh, if if the therapist does punish the client that's going to trigger the woe rule Okay, if the therapist is cold and aloof and doesn't give it, uh, if he withholds his interpretations, that's going to retrigger the experience the client had with the parents. In other words, the therapist is not there to just re-trigger what happened in childhood and just to reenact it. The therapist, the, the therapist is there to notice that that's going to.